Roger Schwartz got an internship at the White House after his freshman year at college. Our professor, Joe DeGangi, boasted about this placement the next year as it was a feather in the cap of the school. Come to our Washington term, you might be able to work in the White House. Imagine, he said, going to work in the White House each day like Roger Schwartz. That always has sounded exciting to me. But in context of what we're celebrating today, let's step back for a moment. How does that compare with the privilege of going to church each day? Forget about the White House. Here we get to rub shoulders with Christ, the King of the universe. Talk about walking the halls of power. That's what we celebrate today. Now, having made this contrast, we still have an analogy in Roger's experience. Ordinary people like you and me in church is like being a sophomore in the White House. Who would have expected such a privilege? At least we want to recognize it when we have it. But in order to really embrace this in our lived experience, let's look a bit closer at Roger's experience. His job was with the Office of the Management and the Budget, a department with a director and a deputy director, and a deputy director for management, and an executive associate director, and several more departments until you got to Roger's desk at the bottom of the organizational chart. He worked for a staffer who, Roger told me, had become disaffected with his work. His boss once dreamed of making a difference, but had since concluded, nothing we do here really matters. They were buried in bureaucracy. And this is much like how it would have been for an Israelite at the time of Isaiah. And if you had faith, it was constantly being undermined by corrupt kings and priests, many levels of compromised leaders, bringing judgment upon the nation. And that's the context of our Old Testament reading, the first reading that we heard today, which we'll get to in a moment. But before we do, let me just ask you this question. Have you ever felt that way in the church? Constant reports of leadership acting corrupt regarding finances or even being flagrant with doctrine. And at times you may feel too far down in the organizational chart to make a difference. It's in this context that God says through Isaiah, I myself will be the shepherd of my sheep. That's the promise. God will intervene and have a direct relationship with his people so that they will not be co-opted anymore. Behold, he says, I, I myself will search for my sheep and I will rescue them. Oh, how we need to hear those words in the church today. Amidst especially a secularizing society and shallow church leaders, we need this assurance that Christ will make himself known as king. Now, I'm here today to say that this is a spiritual reality. God said, I myself will be the shepherd of my sheep. And this promise is fulfilled. But how? First, let's ground ourselves intellectually, and then let's see how this can be true for us experientially. Let's recall the promise in light of our opening illustration. Imagine my old friend, Roger Schwartz was approached by the President of the United States of America. Back then, it was George Bush the senior. And imagine, he said, Roger, I've seen your resume, and I know your heart. You still have ideals. I want you to do my work. I've come down 
to speak with you so that you will follow me. And then he concluded, you start tomorrow morning. Well, that would put going to work in the White House in new light. So this analogy has grounding in our scripture readings today. But you might already be guessing where I am going with this. Yes, you are in service to the king of the universe, and you have a personal relationship with him. And if this is true, then you reign with him. And no bureaucracy can take that from you. Remember, I myself will be the shepherd of my sheep. And indeed, the triumph of the Catholic Church is in the work of the people, not so much the hierarchy. St. John Henry Newman realized that some bishops didn't understand this. So talking to one of his superiors, in a very deferential way, it was about a matter of doctrine, Newman said, well, what would the laity think? And the response was, the laity? Who are the laity? To which Newman responded, Your Excellency, I think the church would look rather silly without them. But the question for us is, how does this work today? when John Cardinal Newman is no longer representing us in the Curia. How do we exercise our rightful reign in the church with Christ? How do we further the kingdom in a hostile world? To help us better understand today's readings, I need to return once more to Roger Schwartz. So he shows up in the west wing of the White House the next day and reports to work with the president. Then the president says, Roger, what are you doing here? Seeing Roger's confusion, he responds, I came down to you to ask you to follow me. That means you are called to go and do the same. See, the problem with Roger is a problem that we often have, is that we assume that the way we're called to reign in the church is the way the world sees ruling. Now, you might get a better idea of where the scripture readings are taking us now. But let me continue. Roger was called to follow the president's example of righteous rule, which is not the worldly way of ruling. And so the president continued, not George Bush I'm thinking now, an imaginary president. You can't serve in the Oval Office unless you do what I did before I got here. And so it is for our Lord Jesus Christ. The trials come before the triumph. And so it is that this is all part of God's kingdom growth. This is the pattern that we all follow. And so the president told him, my heart is to serve the lowest of the low, And that is what I have always done. But I need to be physically in the Oval Office now. So I went to you, the lowest of the low in the White House, so that you would be my hands in the street, seeking those who are lower than you, seeking the lost, binding the crippled, and strengthening the weak. This is the way to righteous rule. And so God says through Isaiah, I will seek the lost. I will bring back the strayed, and I will bind up the crippled, and I will strengthen the weak. And after making this point, he says, I will judge between my sheep. This is the context of the parable in Matthew, and Jesus' audience, the religious leaders, would have known that. So with this in mind, knowing how this shepherd will rule, what does he say to the sheep at the time of judgment? Come, O blessed of my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. In other words, he's saying that You did my work well. 
And he says all this from his glorious throne, honoring those who did his work on the street, who stooped down like him to the lowly. And so the sheep show God's strength in numbers. By the way, have you seen the National Geographic documentary where a wolf seizes a sheep and the other sheep rise up where their hooves get, they put their hooves on the, on the wolf so he lets go and then they stampede and chase away the rest of the wolf pack? Have you seen that documentary? No? It's because it doesn't exist. We want the story to go that way, but that would be using the weapons of the world. That's the worldly conception of power. But the Beatitudes show us how to fight the world with kingdom values. Blessed are you, Jesus says, when you are persecuted falsely for my sake. And blessed are you then when you forgive and when you continue to still serve. St. Isaac the Syrian sums up this way of ruling like this. Be persecuted rather than be a persecutor. Be crucified rather than be a crucifier. Be treated unjustly rather than treat anyone unjustly. Be oppressed rather than zealous. Lay hold of goodness rather than a worldly conception of justice. Jesus calls sheep to do his kingdom work because they follow him. Sheep follow. And so what did the shepherd do? He laid down his life for the sheep. As low as he calls us to go in serving others, he became the poorest of the poor, humbling himself even to death on the cross. Serving the poor is important in part because it's a way in which we learn to carry our cross, even though it's so little compared to what the Lord did for us. How? Because to serve the poor, the sick and the lame, which is not only physical work, by the way, it also includes giving counsel and compassion to those who are hurting in other ways. But when you do any of these things, you give up your time, and that means you have to give up some entertainment. You need to set aside comfort in order to serve the needy. And in order to do this regularly, you cannot be ruled by your passions. You must not be ruled by your passions if you're to free your heart in order to reign with the Lord by doing service. But if you do free your heart this way, though no matter how compromised church leaders might be or no matter how hostile the culture is, no one can take God's righteous rule from you. As you live in charity and in generosity in the name of Christ, God's kingdom will be built through you. Think of the earliest centuries of the church uh, when the Emperor Julian the Apostate tried to suppress Christians. He was a pagan, but he offered this complaint. It is disgraceful that when no Jew ever has to beg and the impious Christians support not only their own poor but ours as well, <laughs> all men see that our people lack aid. In other words, we need to compete with them. And they're putting us to shame. But yes, we've come here to the true halls of power, rubbing elbows, so to speak, with the king of the universe, the one who comes to serve you, to pour himself out to you on the altar. And as you pour out for others, he continues to pour into you. And in this way, our Lord reigns through you.